sadly, sometimes in the community, not all identities are accepted as much as others. For example, the transgender community sometimes gets extremely left out of the GLBTQ, which I personally want to say that's completely wrong. They are part of the community. They are part of the whole alphabet soup. I love them to death. I have a lot of transgender friends or tra uh, identify as some sort of trans. So I consider them part of my family, just like all of you guys, whether you're gay, straight, bi, queer, genderqueer, whatever you identify as. I love all of you. You're awesome. Especially since you're here tonight. Obviously, you know, you want to know some stuff. So thank you for being here. That's awesome. And I guess I'll get into my little history lesson thing. <laughs> when is the oldest that you think LGBTQ history is recorded to? Anybody? Roman. 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 Yes. Greek. Yeah, yes. pretty much. Um, the one that I have as the earliest is from 1623, which is like way, way ago. Is Greece before that though? Yeah. yeah. Greece is before that? Okay. Well, there's a lot of stuff from Greece and Rome and everything, but I guess they didn't really quote document it as history that much because Greek and Roman culture is very different from everybody else usually. They're very accepting. It's just, you know, another person to them. They don't make a big deal about it. If you're gay, you're gay. If you're straight, whatever. So, um, one of the biggest things that, like, one of the biggest first things that I have here is that in 1623, Francis Bacon, a noted homosexual who coined the term masculine love, published the advancement of learning, an argument for empirical research and against superstition. This deductive system for empirical research earned him the title, the father of modern science. Um, basically what's that talking about is it's talking about the very first research that many people did into the whole LGBT spectrum. Um, there's a lot of people in the future that did a heck of a lot more research. Um, for example, one person is Alfred Kinsey. I don't know if any of you know about Kinsey. He <laughs> created what's called the Kinsey scale, which goes from one to six. Um, trying to remember the exact classifications. One and six are like the extremes on opposite sides, right? Yeah. And then the varying numbers in between are basically just variations of whether you're completely neutral, of you love both genders, doesn't matter, whatnot. And then there's the other sides that are, you're mostly this, but sometimes you go that, or you're mostly this, but sometimes you go that. So, Alfred Kinsey, I think, is a wonderful person because he made wonderful strides into sexuality and the topic of sexual orientation because many people didn't really want to touch on that topic at all. Um, let's see here. What's some other stuff that I have? I have a question. What's up? Does love, gender, or like sex? That's a good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, what was the question? The, what was the question again? Because, well, when you said, you know, about uh, the scale of loving loving gender from one to six, does that mean, does that refer only to, to like, sex? That refers to, back when Alfred Kinsey was around, there still was a very much binary of either male or female, um, and it regarded specifically orientation of either heterosexuality or homosexuality, and then the way that it worked was the one was exclusively heterosexual, never doing anything homosexual at all, and six was completely homosexual, not doing anything heterosexual. And then the other numbers were varying degrees. For example, the two was predominantly heterosexual, but sometimes homosexual tendencies. And then opposite five would be mostly homosexual. Is, is sexually based. Yes, it's sexually based. <laughs> Sorry if that was kind of a long-winded answer for your question. <laughs> but it's a good... It's a very good question. Yeah. Um, let's see. Does anyone know the name of the first gay organization? It was called the... the Natasha Society. Sister Lesbian. There you go! I was going to say... I was going to say... 
saying Medellin or something like that, but there you go. Um, it was originally formed in Los Angeles back in 1950. They referred to themselves as a homophile group. Why they called themselves that, I don't really know. But that's a little history with that first organization. It's like how sex with homos. <laughs> well, back then it was kind of considered criminals. Um, and it, I'm kind of a, jumping around, I'm sorry. It was an organization for closeted queers, basically. Um, closeted gay and lesbian people and bisexuals to come together in a safe space where they wouldn't be judged and criminalized. Because it was still criminal to kiss someone of the same sex in public at that time. And who knows what sodomy laws are? Do some of you know what they are? Yes? All right. What's your definition? My definition of a sodomy law is when if you engage in any type of homosexual sex, then you can have be castrated is my definition of a sodomy law. But you can also be imprisoned or fined or other such things. Yes. Also, it depends from state to state, sometimes non-procreative sex, regardless of if it's between a man and a woman or the same gender, um, can be criminalized. Sexual acts other than missionary sex can be criminalized. Yes. I believe law law everyone. In I believe in Arizona oral sex is illegal. I'm a lawbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> I think my of us are lawbreakers here. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I always say when people say we need to always follow the laws. And like, do you know what they are? Yes. <laughs> Some of them are old. Yeah. So which is how many yeah. of you, exactly. yes, select it. <laughs> how many of you guys would think that in 2011 we still have sodomy laws or not? Do you think we don't, or do you think we do? We do. Very good. You guys are good. Uh, it is very sadly true that there are still, I believe, it's five states, twelve states. I think it's a lot. There's a lot of states basically that still have sodomy laws. Um, and you can still get criminally charged for these things, even though we live in 2011, Texas, yeah, Texas has where people are a little more open-minded. It's still not, you know, a happy, happy, perfect world or anything, but we are a little more open-minded now that it's 2011 and people have kind of moved on to a new generation and everything. Um, but we do still have sodomy laws in the nation, and it's kind of sad that we do, because we should have moved past that a long time ago. Uh, back in 1624, it was recorded that Richard Cornish of the Virginia Colony was tried and hanged for sodomy. He was one of the first people that was convicted under the sodomy laws back in 1624. Um, I think that's kind of a big deal because that was the first record of them ever doing something like that. And it kind of sucks because people were killed all throughout time for these acts and really they shouldn't have been at all. All right, in 1962, Illinois becomes the first U.S. state to remove the sodomy laws from its criminal code. That was a big deal because a lot of people back in that time still wanted the sodomy laws. They were totally against repealing them, anything like that. And Illinois was the one that stepped up to the plate and said, hey, we're going to let this happen. We're going to get rid of these laws and we're going to let it be okay. Just like other states now have kind of stepped up to the plate and they're working on marriage equality. For example, this year, New York finally ended up making marriage equality where all genders, all sexes can get married to each other. Um, personally, that's a great success for me because six years ago when I was still living back in Rochester, New York, I actually went to the Capitol and spoke to a lot of the Congress people about making the marriage equality laws. And I feel like maybe I've actually made some sort of a difference now because, you know, maybe some of those people talk to other people and they finally got it pushed through. Um, other states that have gotten marriage equality, California sadly is still fighting for it. However, they have ruled, from what I last know, that Prop 8 is able to be fought in court that it is unconstitutional or was it one? Uh, they still fighting? Okay. Yeah. Um, but it was allowed in court for them to fight that it's unconstitutional so that's a big step in the correct direction. Um, did you have something? Oh just another thing about the criminalization of homosexuality. 
Um, the DSM, the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, removed homosexuality as a like pathological behavior in 1974. Way and too late. <laughs> gender identity disorder is still under dispute, um, as are a lot of other things being seen as pathological that, of course, aren't. Yes. Okay. So um, I thought it was. I was thinking about the marriage equality thing a lot today when I was making my signs. I was trying to think how to say the 1% is fighting marriage equality and things like that because the Mormon Church put $8 million towards towards Proposition 8. They came over once a week and tried to convert my mother to, to vote for or really against marriage equality is what they were trying to get her to vote for. And um, finally she just started leaving her house whenever they come over, because her husband's Mormon. So she just started leaving her house whenever they come over. And um, that's one of the reasons she joined Occupy Orange County, um, was because she believes in the separation of church and state, and she believes that the Mormon church is part of the 1%. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to bring that up. I, I know that there's some Mormons and ex-Mormons that come out here, and I don't want to be offensive to them, but at the same time, their church is fighting to keep me from getting married to a same-sex partner. I think that's... Yeah. That's my two cents. I just have a little point. They are still maintaining their 5013C, even though the 5013C rules state that you're not political. They became political when they donated money, but they still remain 5013C. Lovely! <laughs> um, Alright, so, really quick poll. What year do you guys think was the first gay demonstration in the United States? 1982. Before that. <laughs> All right. 1963 was the first gay rights demonstration in the U.S. It took place on September 19th at the Whitehall Induction Center in New York City, and the main thing they were protesting was against the discrimination in the military. Which piggybacking on discrimination in the military, just this year, finally they repealed "Don't Ask, Don't Tell," which means gays can now openly serve in the military. However, what sucks is the people that got kicked out with dishonorable discharges, they're having trouble getting back in because of the fact that they had a dishonorable discharge on their record. So they're still trying to fight. And the people that are in some of the people that are now running, they're going to try to What did she say? Say that one more time. Uh, some of the people that are in their GOP debates, they say that's the first thing they want to repeal. Don't ask for it. Because um, God told me things. Right? Like, that's the most important thing. Like Rick Perry, just, right? Just so y'all are aware that the person that was instrumental in trying to stop the legislation that just passed about repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell, Governor McCain. Yeah, uh, nice guy. Yeah. Or Senator, I'm sorry, Senator oh, McCain. Yeah, he wants to get rid of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. What a legacy. Right. What a legacy. He also, he also is the one that did the, um, put the, he also is the one that put the, the 1031 amendment into the NDAA about in, indiscriminate, in, in, indefinite detention without trial. And he wanted to make it so that Americans can be arrested on American soil. Um, so yeah, we're going to protest at McCain's office tomorrow, 22nd Street at Camelback. There's lots of reasons to be there. Bring your uh, don't repeal the repeal slides. <laughs> yes. Alright, does anyone know what happened in 1969 in New York City? There you go. What was it? What's that? Stonewall what happened? Riots. Stonewall riots. Stonewall riots. What's that? You're the about Stonewall to find riots. Out. Find out. It was a police raid on the Stonewall Inn in New York City in the wee hours of June 28th that led to four days of battle between police and angry lesbians, gay men, bisexuals, and trans identified people. Um, youth are a major part of these riots that mark the birth of the modern gay movement. Something really interesting that I learned that I didn't know before, what most people have been told about what sparked the Stonewall riots was the death of Judy Garner? Yes? That was her name. Judy Garner. However, something that Tips actually informed me of was, what was it, that she was actually 
Okay, so um, Sylvia Rivera, one of our first ever openly transgender activists who started the Stonewall Riots by throwing a beer bottle, um, and that's why she wasn't on one of our banners, because she was not nonviolent at the time, although I believe she became a nonviolent activist later. <coughs> anyway, Sylvia Rivera was a trans woman who everyone thought was a drag queen at the time, in 69. And so many people have said that the Stonewall Riots were started by a drag queen, but in fact she was a transgender woman and openly identified herself as so. You can read about it in the several trans history books. Um, what was happening is people with more than two sets of, of opposite gender clothing on, such as many of our people here today who are not gay, and some who are, and some who are transgender, and all sorts of, right? Anyone with more than two sets of opposite sex clothing, whatever that meant to the police, because you know how they get to make up their rules at the time and change it, um, was getting arrested. And not only were they getting arrested, they were getting beaten, they were getting raped, and then, um, of course, getting huge fines and things like that on top of it, when so making it virtually impossible for them to stay on rent, ending up homeless. They were getting very, very angry, and then, her name, Judy Garner, was killed by police violence, right? I believe so. Yeah, by police violence because she was wearing more than two pieces of female clothing. And, um, or male clothing. Male clothing, sorry. And, um, that, yeah, because the female to male transgender people who were often called um, drag kings or butch lesbians, and some of them were butch lesbians as well, let's point that out. There were a lot of angry lesbians the next day at that riot, um, were being beaten and raped by cops in jail trying to say, I'm going to fuck the, I'm sorry for my language, I, but that's what they said, you know, I'm going to F the um, boy out of you, basically, and things like that. So the march we had the other day for police violence kind of ties in with what started the Stonewall riots. And then um, gay and lesbian activists came on down and joined in and kept that fight going. And that's how the gay movement kind of started for equal rights. And then, um, I'm not sure, I don't have the exact date of the very first case of it right now, but um, in the 70s, a big virus that was coming about was what's now known as HIV and AIDS. Um, in 1982, there was nearly 800 people that were infected with what was originally known as GRID, they called it the gay-related immunodeficiency disease. They basically said it was a gay disease that only gay people could get. Obviously, they've been proven wrong since there's billions of people that are infected, gay and straight. It does not discriminate gender, does not discriminate against orientation, anything. Anybody can get HIV, anybody can get, well, HIV turns into AIDS, but anybody can get the disease. It's very bad, it's very hard to live with, and I personally know people that have passed away from HIV and AIDS. I know people that are infected with it, and I know some people here have known people that have been infected or that passed away from being infected with HIV and AIDS. <laughs> okay. Um, back in 1973, going back to the uh, homosexuality in the DSM manual, Back in 1973, the board of the American Psychiatric Association voted 13 to 0 to remove homosexuality from the official list of psychiatric disorders in the DSM-2. The resolution also urged an end to private and public discrimination and repeal of laws discriminating against homosexuals. So that was a big deal because a lot of people were following back on the fact that the APA was saying in the DSM that homosexuality was a disease. It's not a disease. It's not going anywhere. You can't get it just by someone coughing next to you or by even just standing next to you, which sadly is still some people's thoughts. Sorry, just because I cough here doesn't mean y'all are going to become gay or bi or lesbian or anything like that. Shoot. Sure. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> um, Can we test that there? Quick cough on Ain't going to work by now, buddy. That's true, right? Right? Um, in 1985, the first memorial to the Nazi gay victims, a pink granite stone monument at Nugunem Concentration Camp, inscribed, dedicated to the homosexual victims of National Socialism, 
is unveiled. What a lot of people don't understand, they I know the Jews were the biggest population that was targeted in the Holocaust and everything, but what a lot of people don't know is that Hitler had a long list of everybody that he wanted to go after. The Jews were on the top of the list. Very soon after that was the gypsies, homosexuals, and redheads, and a bunch of other people. Disabled people. Disabled people. African Americans, basically anybody that wasn't blonde hair, blue eyed, African Americans and in Europe, he wanted to go after. There was just certain groups that he targeted first to go after, and the gays were pretty high up there next to the Jews that he wanted to go after. Um, and instead of having a Star of David on them, they had a pink triangle on them in the concentration camps that singled them out as being either G, L, B, T, any of that whole spectrum. That's what they used to describe them at the time in the concentration camps. I, I've just got a question. Are, are, they, are they called African Americans if they live in Europe? <laughs> no. <laughs> People of African descent. There you go. People of African descent. <laughs> um, let's see here. All right, I don't know why this is really history, but it sounds interesting. In, uh, <laughs> in 1989, Billy Tipton, who was a really big jazz mu musician, died and was discovered to actually be a female after presenting as a man since 1933. Wow. So that's a really long time to go living as the other gender and not be identified as it. And I'm pretty sure back then they didn't really have any of the surgeries or anything that you can get now, correct? Well, they did. <laughs> uh, they did, they, but they weren't good. They weren't very good. <laughs> but that's why it's history, I think, is because um, it was such people a really period. didn't even realize that female to male transgender people existed up until that point. Like, it was very, very, we walk among you and you don't know we're here kind of situation. <laughs> um, an interesting piece of information the first documented gay-straight alliance in a school, which a gay-straight alliance is basically a group of everybody from students at the school that ends up making a equality group and tries to promote equality in the school and in the community. It's also known as a GSA if you've ever heard about that. Um, the first recorded one was in 1996 by Kelly Peterson and it was founded at East High School in Salt Lake City, Utah. The city school board ended up banning all non-curricular student clubs in order to keep the club from meeting. The sad thing is, schools still do this crap even now that there's a law, it's called the Equal Access Act, the EEA for short, which basically says that if a school is going to have any type of club or sports, they have to allow all clubs and sports. That's where we've basically beaten the schools in trying to keep out GSAs, because if they want to keep the GSA out, they can't have football, volleyball, soccer. Right there. Is that apply to only public schools? I believe so. Okay, because I tried to start one in a private Christian school. I didn't do research school, about that. And it didn't work out. <laughs> I didn't do research about that. I think if they're federal, they're allowed to have them. If they get any type of federal funding, then they have to follow the Equal Access Act. Um, otherwise, if they do all of their own funding privately, then I believe they can govern themselves. Okay. For example, I believe, if I remember correctly, Brophy and Xavier don't get federal funding. They have their own system that they use to get funds and everything. So that's why you can't start a GSA at one of those schools. Because I can tell you for a fact, being an all-boys and all-girls school, there's a lot of gays and lesbians over there. Trust me. I know some of them. <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly what year the Equal Access Act was passed. Can't remember that, and I can't seem to see it on my list here. But I know that that was passed several years ago. In fact, I think that was more than 10 years ago. Um, back in 1997, Ellen DeGeneres and her television character Ellen Morgan came out. Ellen becomes the first show to feature a lesbian or gay lead character. This was really, really big because it was the first time ever that there was really gay or lesbian on the TV. So it brought like a public face to everything showing that we're here. We're not going anywhere. 
the whole we're here, we're queer, we're not going away thing. You know, that whole little thing. Um, in 1998, Matthew Shepard, a gay Wyoming college student, is brutally beaten by two young men. They tied him to a fence and they left him overnight. He ended up passing away several days later. He passed away on October 12th, I believe. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm really bad. Um, I believe it's October 12th that he passed away. He was born on December 1st, which coincides with World AIDS Day. Um, it was really sad what happened with Matthew Shepard because he had a very good family structure. His family supported him in being gay, which sometimes you have a really hard time finding. My own father, bringing a personal perspective to this, my own father six years ago, when I first started coming out, told me he didn't want a faggot for a son and pretty much kicked me out of the house. I went and lived with my mom. In the end, it turned out good because now I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona with all of you. Um, but at the time, it hurt like hell yeah, boo. because my father basically told me he didn't want me. And I'm happy for the people that have accepting families because that only empowers you to be even better, to be even more fabulous, as people say. <laughs> um, but no, Matthew Shepard actually stirred up a lot of conversation about hate crimes in general. A lot of different laws were begun because of Matthew Shepard because it brought a very public face and eye to the fact that these things happen. These things happen every day. Every day there is bullying against GLBTQ people. Every day there is people beaten up because of it. I'm pretty sure even every day there's probably someone killed because of it. And we just don't know about it. Um, but Matthew Shepard getting killed brought a lot of public attention to it and actually started a lot of legislation that has now been passed and is in schools and working on getting to even more places. Um, what was another thing? Another thing about Matthew Shepard, what um, a really horrible thing that was started, well, it was already going on, but specifically happened at Matthew Shepard's funeral, Westboro Baptist Church, I'm not sure if any of you have heard about it. Yeah, I say that too. Um, Westboro God Baptist Church. Westboro Baptist Church. Yeah. <laughs> Westboro Baptist Church showed up at Matthew Shepard's funeral and was trying to protest there with signs saying, God hates fags, fags doomed America, and all this other stuff. Their actual website, their website is godhatesfags.com. Very boo. Um, it just got shut down by Anonymous and Mike. Yeah! Woo! Yeah. Woo! That'd be awesome! <laughs> yeah, I heard that. I guess. Awesome! That's perfect. Um, but what was really cool with Matthew Shepard's funeral, with them protesting there, and what has started at a lot of other military protests that people, that they're also protesting at, is a lot of Matthew's family and friends made these big, huge PVC angel wings made out of white sheets and they surrounded the entire family and funeral area and had these big angel wings covering the family so they didn't have to see all of these protesters Woo! if you guys watch i'm trying to remember the documentary oh god oh um laramie project thank you yeah. <laughs> can't believe that slipped my mind but um the laramie project it was done by people from um it was originally a play that was done by a Tectonic Theater Project, they went there themselves to Laramie, Wyoming, and they actually interviewed people. A lot of people from Laramie were very against the play being made and from these interviews going on because they didn't want to believe that this could happen in their own backyard. They didn't want to believe that this could happen with their families, but it did. And um, in the end, the Laramie Project got turned into an HBO film as well, and it's a very good movie. If you guys ever get a chance to see it, I recommend going and seeing it because it's absolutely amazing. And it goes way more into depth about Matthew Shepard, the stuff that happened to him. I don't want to go into it because I'll start crying. It's absolutely terrible. Um, basically, they beat him almost to death. They tied him up to a fence like a scarecrow. That's where Melissa Etheridge's song, Scarecrow, comes from. She wrote that directly in response to his murder. And basically they tied him up and left him like a scarecrow pointed out at the Wyoming sky. 
A lot of people said that that would what Matthew would want to see when if he you know had to go a certain way, he would want to see that because you could see the twinkling lights of the city and there was just a beautiful sky that night. And so a lot of people say that if he had to go, that was the way he should go because he would love that beautiful skyline. Um, let's see. I have your note. In 2002, New York City expanded the definition of gender to include protections for, for trans and gender different people in the New York City Human Rights Law. That's a big deal because that's one of the first times that we've ever seen gender being included in a lot of different rules and laws and everything. We still don't have that here. Exactly. Um, in 2003, or wait, no. In 2002, Gwen Amber Rose Arayo, a male to female transgender teenager, dies after being attacked by multiple individuals. The events leading up to Arayo's death were the subject of a pair of criminal trials in which it was alleged that the attackers were angered by the discovery that Arayo, who at the time was living as a female, was biologically male. In the most recent trial, two of the defendants were convicted of second degree murder, but the jury concluded that no hate crime was committed. That's an absolute atrocity. They had a lot of proof that this was a hate crime. They did it because they found out that she wasn't the sex that she was portraying. This has happened far too much in history. I, uh, we went to Transgender Day of Remembrance earlier last month, and they had a bunch of names of people that have been had hate crimes against them for exactly this type of stuff. 23 this year. 23. But that I, that sounds really low to me, to be honest. That's 23 known. Yeah, 23 known. And that's only known. A lot of times you don't find out about these because families want to protect their honor yeah. and hide this from everyone because supposedly it's dishonor to have that in your family. We won't get started on that one. <laughs> Um, in 2003, the Supreme Court overturned sodomy laws, proclaiming rights to privacy and decriminalizing homosexual behavior. However, for some reason, that still didn't get rid of some of these states that still have the sodomy laws. I believe unless they make a federal law that gets rid of the sodomy laws, those states can keep those laws. It's just like Defense of Marriage Act right now. There has not been a federal amendment saying whether marriage is only man and woman or if marriage is all genders. That's why right now it's up to the states to decide if they want to have a Defense of Marriage Act, which will state if it's between man and woman or if it's everybody or if they just don't have a specific law. Um, in 2004, hundreds of same-sex couples legally exchanged marriage vows in Massachusetts, which is the first U.S. state to allow gay marriage. That's absolutely amazing, and I think it's awesome that they also accept out-of-state people. But the sad part is, for us over here, we're several thousand miles away from Massachusetts. It's kind of hard to get over there to go marry people. We need it here. <laughs> However, it's been a hundred years now that there's been no um, marriage for same-sex people in Arizona. It's marking 100 years now, and the Marriage Equality Walk is doing a 100-mile walk this year, wow. next year, for every single year that there hasn't been same-sex marriage in this state. Last year, it was 99 miles, because it was 99 years. And I wish Sister Marie was still here. Sister Marie Elephant that you met, she actually walked every single 99 miles in Sister Face. And I bless her heart, I don't know how she did it. I don't think I could do 99 miles in Sister Face, no matter how long of a time period it was over. Um, but that was a big deal because Massachusetts was the first state to step up and say, hey, it's legal, we're doing it. Clarifying question. What's up? Sister face. Sister face was the white face that you saw with the different designs and everything. Can I explain um, it? I was actually going to go into the sisters in just a moment. Okay. So I just wanted to wrap up what I had here before I went into all of that. Um, all right. In 2005, at its annual convention in Atlanta, Georgia, the American Psychiatric Association votes to support government-recognized marriages between same-sex partners. That's a big deal. Because a lot of people look to the APA for what they want to decide on things. So 
So it's very good that they said they support it. Uh, in 2006, attorney and transgender activist Kim Coco uh, Iwamoto is elected to the state level Board of Education in Hawaii. She is the first openly transgender person to be elected to a state level office in the United States. That was a very big deal because that's the first trans person to get elected into office. Very big deal. Very good. Um, in 2007, the David Ray Hate Crimes Prevention Act of blank, or David's Law, is a bill first introduced in the United States House of Representatives by Representative uh, Sheila Jackson Lee of Texas. It is designed to reinforce hate crimes and specifically make sexual orientation a protected class alongside race and gender. That was a big deal because there wasn't a lot of laws like that. This was legislation that was actually making it through the House. Sadly, eventually it got voted out. In 2008, Soul Force, an organization committed to confronting religious-based hate, visited 32 colleges and universities that banned the enrollment of openly LGBT students. There's actually a lot more colleges in the U.S. than you would think that ban LGBT people from being in the school open. It's very sad. We live in 2011, almost 2012. You shouldn't have to hide who you are just to be able to go to college for a good education. Um, in 2009, New Hampshire becomes the sixth state to accept same-sex marriages. So that's pretty big because that was six states now that support it. Um, is there anything more recent that I'm forgetting? I guess Glisten hasn't updated this in a little. Anything you guys can think of? Iowa's uh, legalized it also. That's pretty much the end. There's not really anything after that. Oh, but um, going uh, the first openly transgender the first openly transgender minister came out, and you can you can watch a really interesting movie called the. Uh, Call Me Malcolm. It's a it's a great documentary about someone from the. Uh, United Churches of Christ, they, they have another name as well, but um, UCC, which there are UCCs around here that are openly supportive of LGBT, so yay that. All right, and now, going back to the <laughs> sister question, um, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence was originally formed in 1979 in San Francisco, California. That was the very first founding house of the organization. Since then, it has become an international organization. There are sisters in almost every country or a mission in every country except for, I believe they said, Africa, New Zealand, and Antarctica. But there was a sister that went to Antarctica. We don't know if she was spreading joy to the penguins or whatnot, but she went to Antarctica. So, <laughs> name for them. <laughs> huh? We have a house in China now? I believe so. Oh. Maybe. I'll have to look into it. I don't know. I just remember those ones specifically. Um, but the sisters originally began from my understanding, and Mischief can back me up on this, was that they originally started when HIV and AIDS was becoming very big in the gay community. Because in the beginning, it was essentially a gay disease. However, we now know that it wasn't just that. It got into everybody else. Um, but. The white face that they do, as you saw in some of the sisters that were here tonight, the white face as the base was for anonymity, and it's also representing the sadness from everyone that was dying at the time. Because in 1970, late 1970s and early 1980s, a hell of a lot of people died from HIV and AIDS. I sadly don't have the numbers with me, but it's been a lot of people. And there's still a lot of people that die from it now, even though we have all of these new age drugs and all of that stuff that can help. Um, but they do the white face as a base for the sadness that was in the community and also for anonymity because a lot of people were in jobs where if they were doing something like that, they would get fired or they would get in trouble. Like the V for Vendetta masks. Exactly. Um, and then the colorful designs that they do on top of the white face is to kind of bring joy to the community, bring the happiness back rather than the sadness and everything. Um, the Grand Canyon House in Arizona specifically, uh, myself, I'm a part of, I'm a postulate with them right now. 
I'm on the ranks going through there to become a fully professed sister. Mischief here is a fully professed sister. I meant to be in face tonight, but I didn't have enough time to be able to get ready and everything. Um, otherwise, I would have been here as postulant Opalese. Um, and she is Sister Mischief S. Merrymaker, correct? When I'm, but here, I, I'm wearing my father garb, so I, when I go out as a father, I'm Father Bane of Humanity. Um, <laughs> father Bane of Humanity, because the, the Pope, I usually wear a mitre like the Pope, and it has a transgender symbol on it, because the Pope said last year that transgender people and gender activists are the bane of humanity. He later re rescinded that, but not before I'd taken the name and said big F you to that comment. <laughs> Claimed it as my own and made it an empowering thing. So I am the bane of humanity. <laughs> um, yeah. But basically, what the sisters do is we go out in the community, we do a lot of volunteer work, we do fundraisers for different organizations. Most recently, we've had events that have been benefiting Logan's Playground, which is a local program that deals with children that are infected with HIV or they're affected by it, by their family being infected by it. Um, it's a very good organization. It's been around for, <laughs> God, how many years now? What, the Grand Canyon Sisters? No, the uh, Logan's Playground. Oh, Logan's Playground. Oh, I don't remember. I don't know. Like All I know is it's a really good organization. Um, other organizations that we've benefited is One in Ten, which they were supposed to be here tonight. I'm sorry that they weren't here. Um, One in Ten is a uh, LGBTQ and straight ally youth social support group in Phoenix. Um, we also now have locations in the West Valley and over in Tempe. Um, One in Ten originally started like 15, 20 years ago in someone's house. It basically started in the living room and now has grown to where we're getting our own center. That's almost 3,000 square feet. We've also got the Yep House that's over at 12th Street and McDowell right now. That's our own little house that we have as a drop-in center and our own little area to just be ourselves. Yep is the Youth Empowerment Project and it gears specifically towards the um, minority use of the color and also more of, it originally started more gearing towards the gay youth because there wasn't a lot of programming specifically for them. So they were trying to start one for just the gay youth, but obviously we can't forget our bisexual, lesbian, transgender, queer, questioning, straight ally, all of those people. We can't forget them in our family because they are a part of our family. So YEP has grown to just be another part of 1 in 10. That is for ages 14 to 24. Um, what's up? Just a little point of information on that that will tie back into the 1% the again. Um, so the reason that YEP House was only for gay male youth at first is because that's the, the only grants they were able to get. Because often people do not do um, studies and create grants for transgender people and for lesbians. They weren't able to get any sexual health, um, which is where their grants came from, um, grants for lesbians or bisexuals or transgender people. Um, so, and I know that because I had a lot of transgender youth coming to me saying we don't feel our needs are being met and I researched it and found out what's going on. Um, and so we basically had to create a free method of reaching out to the LBT because there weren't any grants that we were able to get for that. Um, the 1% uh, is keeping us down, man. <laughs> Um, personally for me, I've been involved with 1 in 10 and YEP for, God, like five, six years now, ever since I moved here in 2006. Um, and they're amazing organizations. If you guys ever get a chance to check them out or support them, um, they have a lot of fundraising events and the different bars and everything. Um, they're great organizations. They serve a lot of youth and I've been kind of a leader within them and everything. Um, and it's just a really good organization. Um, but going back to the sisters. Oh, I thought you were in the list of organizations. No, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. I kind of sidetracked with the one in ten thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but going back to the sisters, um, the Grand Canyon House started how many years ago? It started. It was a mission seven years ago, and our sixth year anniversary as an officially um, house. As an official house, um, there's a fancy word for it. But um, Exequator? Yeah, 
it, it, we had Exequator and became official house. Anyway, the six year anniversary is coming up this year, like in February 14th, I believe, is our official. Yes, the 14th. Yeah. Which doesn't really make any sense to me because we first manifested April 1st for All Fools Day. <laughs> so that's coming up again this year. But yeah. Um, but yeah, basically, what, um, the sisters just do a lot of volunteer work, we do a lot of fundraising. And we just go out and spread joy in the community. It's fun. And we get to dress up like nuns with veils and everything. We're 21st century drag nuns or LGBTQIA nuns. They used to say that we're 21st century gay nuns. Um, but not everybody's gay. That, yeah, but not everybody in the organization is gay. We have straight sisters. We have straight fathers. Uh, we have, and they could be of either gender. We have transgender people. and. This house here in Arizona, ironically enough, was the first house to have, we were, the, we were not the first house to have transgender members, um, but we were the first house to officially change our mission to include the whole LGBT, et cetera. Um, and we were the first house to have an openly transgender abbess, uh, AKA president. So. I, I'd like to say one more thing about the sisters, which is um, the reason the sisters are important to me personally and the reason I became a sister, I think I heard someone asking that kind of quietly in the back, like, why would you be a sister, um, was because when I was, well, the reason the sisters are uh, important in general, I feel, is, is because we expiate stigmatic guilt, which means basically we tell people it's okay to be yourself, it doesn't matter who says it's not okay. And we spread joy, which means many different things to many different sisters, depending on what you, when you ask them and how well you know them. And um, people say, people, well, some of the sisters like to say we spread um, omniscient, omniversal joy these days. <laughs> they just keep expanding it, you know? Like, but um, why it was important to me was when I was 13 years old, I'd been getting beat up a lot for being myself. I'd been getting called faggot and dyke because nobody could ever tell what gender I was. And um, so they either felt I was like a hyper feminine man or, or boy rather, or I was a butch girl and they could never figure out which it was. And so, um, and so I was feeling kind of alone in the world. And one day I was walking home and I started hearing, pe and I never heard the name, these words used at the same time, but I started hearing people calling out faggot and dyke and all at the same time. and faggot go home I was like I'm on my way home you know and I peeked over the book that I was reading which is like a really good technique for hiding from bullies is stick your face in a book on the way home and um, it was this little cluster of act up people on the last march we ever had in my hometown Irvine California the last public march they had um, because my neighbors started throwing bottles and calling them names and physically and verbally harassing them but so there's a little cluster of like, I don't know, 30 people with signs marching. And I'm sure some of you can relate to being in little marches like that and how terrifying it can be when people are opposing you and yelling at you and threatening you with pepper spray and putting their hands on their weapons. Um, and that's what they looked like. They looked like angry, scared people. and They're yelling and like, we're here, we're queer, get used to it and things like that. Like ACT UP was great for. And then there was this one little ray of light dancing around the outside, and that was Sister Explosion, Sister X, as people called her. And she was one of the founding sisters in San Francisco, but she had HIV and it became AIDS, so she came home to Irvine, California to be with her family. And even though she was very sick, she dressed up as a sister and she danced around, and I think that was actually the last year of her life. And um, she came up to me and she put her hand on my heart and she said, you're fabulous, honey, now run along home, it's not safe here. And I ran home yelling, we're here, we're queer, we're fabulous, you know? Which I'm sure my family did not understand at all at the time. Um, and that's why I joined the sisters was because my in my short 13 years, I felt so alone and so ostracized from society. And in that moment, I found someone who was like a he, she, it, I couldn't tell what this person was. And I found someone who was proud of it, embraced it, and was fabulous just for who she was. And so I became a sister or a father, depending on my mood. Um, <laughs> and I do that intentionally to fuck with people's heads because of the way I was treated as a child, like to get it into people's minds that gender can be a fluid thing for some people. Um, and I, and I do it to remind people out there that they can be themselves, whether you're a transgender girl who looks like a man, or you're a straight guy who occasionally wants to put on a dress, 
or you're a girl who secretly feels like you're a boy or you're gay or you're lesbian or you're bisexual and you feel like you're really marginalized within the gay community, etc. So whoever you are, the sisters are here to say it's okay and we love you. And my last little thing for today. And it's okay to be straight too. No guilt. I'll love all time, no guilt. Yeah, thanks, um, man. My last thing that I really want to do tonight, I want to thank Zen Jen for coming out. She's Yay. with This Is How, um, which is a transgender organization in the Valley, correct? Um, she's the only one that actually kind of came out and stayed tonight. So I thank, thank you for coming out. Thank you. Um, another organization that kind of supported this night um, was One Voice Community Center. Um, they're located over at 7th Avenue, just south of Campbell, which it's one of very few um, LGBTQ community centers. And they've got a library in there, they've got meeting rooms, they've got this, that, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, they also very much promoted this event. Um, and one in ten and yep promoted this event they were supposed to be here tonight i'm sorry that they didn't end up staying um there's confusion with all that but um i just want to thank those organizations for promoting this and coming out specifically you um and i want to thank the sisters even though they're not here anymore i want to thank them for coming and doing their blessing um because <laughs> that actually almost brought me to tears that they me actually too. came here um uh, because there were some unhappiness about that but they showed up so that made me really happy um what's up they had three other events tonight so we didn't expect them to be here that was fabulous I just wanted to uh, let everybody uh, know also that at 12th Street in Virginia, there is a uh, Lambda Community Center where they do 12 they do 12 step meetings. They have AA meetings, they have CA meetings, they have NA meetings. So if you know anybody in the LGBT or even straight people that uh, need you know substance abuse uh, support, that's a, that's a great place to go. I go there every Thursday. Thank you. Um, I would like to share a story about somebody who's experienced violence because of their sexuality. Okay. Um, I have a very good friend of mine. He is, or she, excuse me, is a drag queen up in New York. Goes by the name of Isis Vermouth. Um, mm -hmm. One night we were hanging out, me and her at a bar, and it was a redneck bar. Because mm. let's face it, Mickey's a redneck. Uh, we were hanging out and a group of fellows decided that it would be great sport to pick on the drag queen. Um, to make a long story short, both me Too and late. Isis ended up getting severely injured by a jumpy. Now, the reason this story affects me is like, or it affects me because I got beat up. But the thing is, I lost my point. Sorry, I haven't slept in a while. Um, the violence towards people of different sexualities isn't just affecting them anymore, it's affecting those around them now. Just like, okay, they were attacking her, but because she's my friend, I stepped up. You're not gonna hurt my friends. I don't care where they decide to rest their uh, genitalia. Shouldn't matter. <laughs> but we ended up, we ended it, like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, not someday. Uh, but, I stepped up to protect my friend and in doing so was beaten just like she was because they assumed that I myself had the same sexuality when, well, yeah, I wasn't a dress earlier so I can't really say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, that is my story of violence against people of different sexualities and uh, yeah. Thank you. I didn't yeah, I was just like focusing on everybody's face. Anybody else have a story? I have one. Okay. Uh, I guess my life has been a life of trials and tribulations, starting with but my uh, natural parents uh, committing various actions against me, and I ended up getting in uh, foster care for seven years as a result. In uh, 1986, I was at a group home. It's like the 35th placement I had in foster care, and uh, some of the uh, there's five kids. And I was walking back from their cent the central office back to one of the cottages where we stayed. And uh, what happened is they got some inkling or impression or something because I wasn't playing all the sports and stuff that everybody else was that I was gay. 
so it was a, the, the day in it was in January that year, and there was a snowstorm that blew through Richmond, Virginia. So there was a lot of snow on the ground. And so what happened was basically the five of them, there was five of them, they kind of got around me and they surrounded me almost in like a star point type fashion. And they started throwing what I thought were snowballs, but it ended up being ice balls. So, and so anyway, the staff wasn't there to stop it at the time. They came out a minute or so later. But at that point, I got extremely angry, and I felt my life was in jeopardy. So I looked and I quickly spotted which one, which was the smallest of the bunch, went and grabbed that kid. And again, I was just extremely angry, and I was almost as tall as I am now as, as I was then. And so I grabbed the first kid by the belt and by the shirt, lifted him straight up, and then smashed him down. And the idea was to try to smack him down on the ground and knock him out. Uh, just, it was the only thing I, again, I was just in a total rage. It turned out I smacked him against the corner of a boulder. I wasn't paying attention. Ooh. Backside down, paralyzed him. Next person, I then turned to the next person, and did the same drill. Got to him, lifted him up, but this time smashed him down on the ground, so he was just disoriented. Third person, third, this is a, the, the medium size again. Same drill, same deal, got him down on the ground, and at that point, the two biggest ones had caught up to me, and they had me, they had me tackled down to the ground. And I thought that was gonna be the end of it, or end of me anyway. But the staff of the group home came out, and they broke it all up. And I come to find out much later, they were not only suspecting that I was gay, but also they were extremely jealous of the fact that I had this cottage, had a, like a, it was like a privilege program, and I had the maximum privileges possible. I could pretty much go and leave from that group home whenever I wanted, unless it was the middle of the night, or a school night or something like that. So they were jealous at that, and they thought that I was gay. So, I didn't get a restriction, and that's one thing they were trying to do, is get me on a restriction so I would lose all those privileges have to start over back in their level system. Then, the interesting thing was then the, uh, the one kid that I thought was permanently paralyzed, it was, it was only temporary. Um, basically, I'd smashed him down in the corner of a rock, you know, and it basically, well, I thought, you know, I guess they thought it was snapping his spinal column, but it ended up repairing himself and he was back in mobile. But the saga continues because then the parents of these kids that were in a group home decided they were going to sue me. And they also tried to press criminal charges against me as well for assault. So the judge heard the criminal charges and basically um, at that point he said, this is ridiculous. You have a per you have one person trying to defend themselves against five people. They're going, to, they're going to send five people after this one guy, one boy, to defend himself. There's no way in the world I'm going to try to let criminal charges go against this, this boy. And if you try to appeal it, I will go to the appellate court and speak on this behalf myself. So, but it still didn't end because then the same parents tried to issue a lawsuit against the state of Virginia, the group home, and myself in a civil lawsuit. And thankfully, the same judge actually heard the first one, then heard the second, and then they came in for the third. And basically, the judge laughed at this and said, wait a minute, it doesn't matter what he does in his private life. The bottom line is that he was assaulted and he was defending himself and he was defending his life. And he got that message across quite clearly in the, in the trial. So, you know, your lawsuits are dismissed. And don't bring in another lawsuit here again. If you do, I will find all of you in contempt of court and uh, issue all the fine instead of the one. Unfortunately, I have way too many people that I could talk about, um, but I want to touch on. Um, I want to touch on two. Um, so HIV and AIDS started impacting me very early on in life. Um, I was born in '70, and I was fortunate or unfortunate enough to kind of grow up in the '80s, and. I had, as I said, um, LGB people who came into my life to help me with my activism for Deaf President Now and ADA and other things we were standing up for at the time, like ACT UP. And um, so in what happened is I, I had a lot of Deaf friends on my campus. We had 250 Deaf students. And um, so the interpreters who happened to be lesbian and gay themselves and, and one bisexual, um, kind of pulled aside those of us that they felt were marginalized 
um, for our sexuality or gender in the school and took us on, took us all on um, little outings around the school to, to do little activist type things and taught us. So we became very close with these people because not only were they interpreting in our classes, but they were taking us around to do these little activism type things and um, direct actions, if you will. And um, one of the gentlemen had HIV and none of us knew it because back then most people didn't know what HIV even was. Um, it wasn't being called GRID anymore, it was being called HIV. But still, like people thought you could sit on a toilet and catch it, you could hug someone and catch it and whatnot. So he had to be closeted about having HIV because he might have lost his job working in a school. And we didn't find out until he had already passed away from AIDS-related complications and pneumonia. Um, so I want to remember him today. And then, um, even a little closer to home, uh, I dated a man in college who um, had HIV. And um, we were very close. He was kind of my kindred spirit, you know, and um, he was this teeny little Filipino guy. And he had so much joy and spark and life in him. And um, he used to take me, this was back when I was severely disabled. I was in an electric wheelchair. I had to be lifted in and out of my chair. And I was also much skinnier back then because they hadn't started putting me on steroids and such yet. So he could actually lift me in and out of my chair. And he would put me in a, um, a manual chair and take me down to the um, Santa Monica Pier and take me on rides and to do things when most of the time I was stuck in my house because I was so severely disabled that really I couldn't do anything if somebody didn't take me out. And um, I mean, he was just such a wonderful love and light. Uh, he chose to marry someone who also had HIV because he felt that um, he didn't want to be in the situation of putting someone who did not have HIV in danger. Um, and unfortunately, what a lot of people don't realize is that if you have different types of HIV, you can contaminate each other's... Um, sorry, what? Super infection. So, yes. Um, your, your blood can become like super infected, basically. And so um, what happened was his job let him go for um, because they found out that not only was he gay but he had HIV and his insurance was cut um, and they told him he was going to die and so he had um, decided to sell off his life policy and just live off of that this happened a lot in the in the eight, late 80s um, and then they discovered this new cocktail of drugs and put him on it and suddenly had more life and we had some time together and then in, in the whole spiel of it, what ended up happening was he couldn't get more insurance, he couldn't get another job. Eventually the cocktail stops working and we lost him. And I think that it's so sad that in this day and age, or in, even in that day and age really, it, it, when he died in 95, um, there were solutions. He could have, he would have still been alive if it weren't for our faulty financial situation in this country weren't for our faulty government and if it weren't for our faulty um, health care system. Um, I truly believe that people from the 80s would still be alive today if it weren't that there was so much homophobia that was actively practiced in our government that they really wanted us to die. I mean, it's it's been documented. And so I, I think that um, today as we remember these people that we should remember that they're in this fight too. They're part of our history. It's part of why I do what I do. I lost two, two very close friends, Suzanne Target and Uncle Craig in uh, November of 2004 to HIV. And I just want to remember that. I lost a dear friend, well, we lost a dear friend in 2010. He had HIV. Um, for many, many years and was diagnosed when he was in the service when it was um, a psychiatric ailment when he was diagnosed and um, they put him in a psychiatric hospital when he was in the service. But he got out and, but 
ultimately it was his heart that killed him. Um, but he had HIV for many, many years and lived with it. But we still miss him. He was, um, Gail Annis was his name, and he was a dear heart. And he took care of uh, many, many people and had a great sense of humor. Well, I want to thank you all for sharing your stories, and above all else, thank you for being here tonight. Um, it really makes me feel good that all of you showed up, um, because I put a lot of hard work into this night. So, I thank you for being here and letting me share with you guys. And with thank that, you. we'll go thank ahead you, and go on the camera.